<laughs> We're already dancing. <laughs> Hi, everybody, and welcome back to yet another cracking edition of the Map Round Show. This is the Secrets of Fail series where we're talking to successful uh, CEOs. <laughs> Hopefully, they're successful, uh, all about their epic business blunders. And uh, with us in the hot seat today is the CEO of Merchants Fleet, Brendan Keegan. Welcome to the show. Welcome. Excited to be here and uh, talking about failure. Exciting, know, right? uh, exciting topic. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Well, let's get into it. Uh, so let's start with the elevator pitch, uh, Brendan. What exactly are you guys up to over, over there at Merchants Fleet? All right. So we're, we're, we're in a business that's not really sexy. So let me explain it this way. If you're driving down the road later today, and as you're driving down, one out of five vehicles you see is actually a commercial fleet vehicle. Now, you'll recognize Postal Service, UPS, FedEx, Amazon. Those are the obvious ones. But, you know, Joe, Joe's HVAC and Sally's Painting Company, you know, just lo local business. So, okay, that's commercial fleet. We are the fourth largest commercial fleet provider in North America. We actually provide those vehicles, the funding and all the services around them for all those vehicles in the U.S. And again, one out of five going down the road later today, those are commercial fleet. And we provide the vehicle, the funding and the services to make, to make, uh, to make America run. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. So, I mean, what what does a, your typical customer look like? Are they mom and pops with a you know a need to supply product from A to B, or is it enterprise and you know huge uh, commercial fleet companies with everybody in between? Yeah, well, you know, we're about a three billion dollar company, so we tend to focus on the larger fleets. So we are big in last mile. Think of last mile, all the home delivery and e commerce companies that are showing up at your your house. Um, th those are clients of ours, as well as companies that are coming out to uh, for pest control. You know, you you might see a you might see a Toyota Trunger pull up. They got chemicals in the back, all that specially up their equipment. There's that. We're in 20 different industries, and uh, you know, again, you know, it's exciting if you're if you're in this industry. But literally, after if you listen to this and you drive down the highway today, all of a sudden you'll realize. Well, there's there's a pest company, there's an HVAC company, there's a painting company, uh, there's an infrastructure company. Oh wow, there's a Verizon, and, and you'll you'll literally see vehicle after vehicle. So you know we're we're across all those industries, but we tend to work with larger clients that have you know in excess of a hundred units, as all the way up to a hundred thousand uh, oh. units in their in their fleet. All righty, epic stuff. Um, cool. So let's get into the meat and the potatoes of uh, this series, uh, Brendan. What is your epic story of fail for our audience around the world today? Well, uh, I, I can tell you uh, it's anniversary date. It is on April 6th every year. Um, I, I celebrated it. Um, I actually celebrated. I put a post out on social media. It was a number of years ago, and it was an epic failure. So this is the sixth time I've had a chance to to lead a company as as CEO and president. And I've actually gone through full sales cycles with five of them, you know, where, you know, I, I went in a lot of times they were turnarounds and they were transformations. So they weren't doing well or they could do better. Uh, and then part of my job on behalf of private equity venture capital was to sell the company. So April 6th, and I, I know it because it was the start of my son's lacrosse season. Um, I'm a really good dad. I leave my phone in the car. I talk to somebody at 255 and they're signing the deal tomorrow. We're selling the company. It's going to be successful. I leave the phone in the car. A lacrosse game is an hour and a half. If you're curious, I come back to my car and have a voicemail. Deal's off. <laughs> okay. Now, this is after a full year of courting some of the biggest private equity firms, going through a really sophisticated process. And I'm like, wait, we were signing it on April 7th at 8 in the morning. What happened between 2.55 and 4.30? And I, uh, I can tell you, I just sat there numb in my car. I just literally was like, how could this possibly happen we had been through months of due diligence. We had, you know, we all had tons of lawyers looking at the deal. It was a big deal. And boom. And at that moment, I, I, I'm not going to say I felt like the world stopped, but uh, my heartbeat, if I had had a Fitbit at the time, would have probably been going pretty crazy. <laughs> and uh, it was just failure. You're like all this responsibility on my shoulders, everyone have, looking to me to lead this. And it just totally blew up between 2.55 and 4.30 on April 6th. Fuck, epic. <laughs> That's pretty yeah, epic, yeah. right? So it what's horrible. A, it's a bit why, though. Are you able to share, like, what, what was the reason for it? To, like, I mean, it's 90 minutes. So how did that all turn around? Yeah, well, you know, you, you know, when I 
after I took a little time to compose myself before returning the phone call. Um, and thankfully, the person wasn't local because I might have wound up in the back of a cop car for homicide. Um, <laughs> so I'm glad it, it was over phone. And, and, and we didn't even do a Zoom. I just called them as I was sitting there in the parking lot. And, and I called and just said, hey, you know, walk me through what happened. And he said, hey, you know, our investment committee has just decided, um, you know, this is too big a deal for us. And I'm like, okay, but we've been working on it for so many months and we're so deep into it. And like, that's something like our company size hasn't changed since you met us six months ago, nine months ago. I, I don't know the exact how many months ago they had. I go, you know, we've, we've been together so many times, like nothing's changed. You know, we, we've beaten our numbers or and so forth. So I, I think in a situation like that, you get the answer that the person gives you, but there's usually an answer behind that. And, and, and I'll take a shot at the answer behind the answer. Um, you know, sometimes in large private equity firms, you know, they're, they're partner based. And I think there were a few partners that just didn't like the deal from the get go. And the, the partners that were leading it probably muscled it to get it through because they really wanted to do it. And my guess is on that last day, when they were all passing the paper around to sign off, the, the partners that didn't want to do it got really vocal and uh, the partners that didn't want to do it didn't have the political capital to push it through. Mm. So, um, but, you know, it kind of independent of whatever reason, you kind of just sit back and you go, so here's the, the, the pile that I'm left to deal with starting April, April 7th. Yeah, the, I've also been, or maybe probably not, haven't done deals that size, but certainly sold businesses and had, 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 you know, like 12 meetings, you know, not, cause it takes like a year to sell something. Um, and then you, you, you know, you get to the final thing and then it's just like you left with the bag of vacuum. It's like, well, you know. <laughs> yeah, you know, what, I, what I'm used to is, you know, you go out to 40, 50 buyers, you narrow the list, six, seven, eight people bid, you get two, three finalists, you narrow it to one. And um, you're very familiar with, you know, there's going to be 30, 40 people that don't want to, you know, buy your business and, and they're weeded out early. Never have I been through three rounds where you're at the, the final yeah. table. I mean, er everything has been negotiated and and, you know, at that point, you know, they've bought off on, they've written off on the press release that's going out the next morning. So, I mean, they've brought their PR firm and first time, you know, um, I've ever had it happen at that latest stage. And, uh, and it's actually at that latest stage, it, it's the roughest because everyone's expectations mm. are set and everyone's exhausted. It mm -hmm. takes a lot to get it to that, um, to that point. So, uh, definitely, definitely a different feeling to have. Yeah, it's frustrating, man. So tell me, uh, Brandon, when you think back at that or on that time, and and when you re when you reflect on that experience, what stands out for you as a key lesson that you now take forward with you? Uh, well, the first thing that I did is 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 you know I, I just took a little time, uh, called my wife first, called my CFO, and then and then I I sent a, a, a note to the board and said, hey, here's what happened, um, and I don't think that we should get on a phone later today. I think everyone ought to just take the afternoon, take the evening and, and give us a day. But uh, if I had to summarize, like, you know, what, what did I learn? The first thing I'd say is you got to lean into failure. Like, like it's not going to fix itself. Like if, if I had said, oh man, I don't know what to do or this isn't my fault or um, what do you guys think we should do? Now that's part of the process asking for others input, but you have to lean into it. You got to say, okay, it failed. And, and I am going to be the person to, to help get it back on track. So the first thing you got to do is, is really lean into the failure and accept it. Uh, I'd say the second thing I learned is you, you got to take time to breathe and assess. So, you know, to have called a board meeting at 5.30 or 6 p.m., it wouldn't have been productive. It, it, it just wouldn't, everyone would have been you know, in a, in a, in a very, in a very reasonable way, bitching, complaining, what's going on. It just, everybody needed their own time to, to process. Okay. The third thing, and I think maybe one of the most important, once you wake up the next day, you got to move on quickly, but well, you got to say that was April 6th. Okay. Got it done. Mm. Today's April 7th. And by the way, um, not everyone's going to move on with you. You're going to have people that on April 7th and on April 8th and on May 8th and June 8th are negative, are toxic and are going, well, hey, if that had happened previously, you just got to block that because it's not, you know, it's not like you got to sit there and say, hey, that was April 6th. That no longer exists. That's that's evaporated. But you are going to have people that want to relive that. 
And in those moments, you got to stay positive because mm. it, it's so easy to get drugged down into, hey, well, if that had happened April 6th, we wouldn't be doing that. It's so easy to go, oh, I agree. And, and next thing you know, you just spent the afternoon, a day, whatever, um, being negative. That's not going to get you to, to where you want to go. But in, in staying positive, I, what I've found, surround yourself with good people because it's hard. At that point, you, you feel alone. You feel uh, the weight of the world on you. But if you have good people around you, they're not going to be toxic. They're not going to be negative. They're going to sense your positivity. They're going to see you taking responsibility and leaning in. And then they're going to lean in on you. And they're going to be there with you. Uh, the next couple of things I'd say is uh, develop options. I remember going back to a board saying, hey, here's eight options. And, I, and immediately they jumped in and they said, oh, option one's horrible. Option eight's horrible. I'm like, oh, man, option one and eight are horrific. They're horrible. But they're options yeah. like that. You know, like I think, you know, your job at that point is to say, I'm going to try to be as objective. I'm not going to say what the best thing to do is. I'm going to just lay out a whole series of options, because when you lay out eight options, you start to realize, well, one and eight are the bookends and they stink and two and seven aren't good. And what winds up happening is you start to yeah. hone in on, well, maybe there's a middle ground and that's option, you know, four or five. And then all you got to do at that point is focus on winning. So, you know, for us, we said, okay, four, five, and six are reasonable in our options. And then it was, we're just going to focus on a win. Um, but what I'll tell you, the last one, and this is a personal one, forgive, but never forget. So if I hold up my phone, I have one voicemail on my phone, one voicemail. It's from that day. And I keep that voicemail and I play it every once in a while because it motivates me, but it, I always just remember, you know, hey, forgive that person, but never forget. I think there's a lesson to be learned there in that uh, we want to block negativity, but we don't want to forget negative things that happen because in those negative experiences or at failures, there's so much to learn and take forward. Mm. Yeah, it's a, there's so much that I like. I want to add to that, but we don't have time. But basically, just maybe if I could, just one thing. I think just what I thought was really interesting about what you said was um, was this idea of of you know continually dying to yesterday so that you can be present tomorrow or today. You know what I'm saying? And yeah. I think like we all we all trying to build businesses, sell businesses, whatever we're trying to do, and we're at the mercy of other people always. You know, and it sucks in some sense, um, but and we always get let down, like in, as you were describing. And also what I loved about what you said was you re shifted the focus of your team onto options. Like I'm a big believer in options because options is like freedom. If you, do, if you, freedom is your ultimate, it's one of the most uh, highest um, values or gifts that you can ever have as a business owner. Um, and if you don't have options, you don't have choice and therefore you don't have freedom. Um, and so having options as you did was a really powerful way to shift focus of your, of your board, right? Well, you know, also when you have options, you realize like, you know, if somebody says, hey, you know, I really wish it had gone through, then when you say, but that's not there. Then you sit there and go, here is the art of the possible. Like, which one do you want? And then you just pick the best one or the most likely one or the highest probability one or whichever. And then you process it and move on. And I think too many times people get caught in the abstract. Why this happened to us? You know, this isn't fair. And you're like, yes, yes. But that's not, that is not going to help you win. It's just not going to help you win. Mm -hmm. It makes you feel better. It makes you feel better, right? Um, you know, maybe talk to a therapist about it, but I'm not sure, you know, if you're trying to solve, like in my case, the business problem of selling the company, it's not going to get you there. Yeah, for sure. So Brandon, you could get into the Matt Brown Show time machine and kind of go back to April 6th. Uh, what year was that, by the way? Ah, uh, geez, what year was it? Like, uh Eight, nine years ago, 10 years ago. Okay. So April 6th, eight, nine or 10 years ago. And, you know, knowing what you now know in hindsight being a perfect science, what would you do differently uh, and why? Uh, probably nothing. Yeah. I probably wouldn't do anything because we didn't control what happened. Like the failure was the failure. Um, and, and I think, by the way, if I brought the person on that backed out, they would sit there and say, none of this was on Brendan and his team. Um, now, I think having a little bit more experience at this particular point helped me. Um, earlier in my career, I can tell you what I would have done. I would have called the board meeting at 530. I would have got on. I would have said, this is BS. This is crap. This is horrible. 
And all I would have done is taken a group of people and spun them up. Um, and I think just having a little bit more maturity. And by the way, when I, when some of them started calling me saying, hey, can we talk about it? Uh, no, we're going to talk about it tomorrow. Because like in that moment, we all just needed to let the emotion just go. Mm. Um, so if I could in, in a time machine, um, you know, are there lots of little things? Sure. But I think the I think when things happen and it's raw, I think that's where growth comes development comes mm -hmm. um and i can tell you my my development in my career has been about my eq um <laughs> i look back at you know where i was 20 years ago and i had the eq of like a small mouse um <laughs> you know like 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 you know i just was was really if you will aggressive you know hey we can solve anything and you know why this happened and i think as you mature and you have more experience and you gain more eq and you're more self-aware of you and others you really learn Everything doesn't have to happen today. And and that would probably be my maybe my parting advice is, you know, channel your EQ, slow things down. Have you ever heard of like an athlete in a championship game say the game just slowed down and it came to me? Yeah. S same thing here. Slow the game down, slow your business down and let it come to you and get in that flow state. Mm. Brendan, what is your advice to other CEOs uh, listening or watching us right now? about the importance of failing or, or failure in becoming successful. Yeah, I actually talked about it with my team last week. What I'll tell you is if, if you're leading a company, with CEO, executive director, managing partner, and you're not failing, I'll tell you right now, you're not building anything great. You're building something good. You're building something average. Um, if you're building something great, you're failing. You're, you're, you're pushing the edges. You're pushing the brown boundaries of – services in your industry or thought leadership or being progressive or trying new things. But if you're not failing, what I'd say when you look in the mirror tomorrow morning, when you get up, go, hey, I'm CEO and managing partner of an average company. And if you're good with that, keep on going. But if you look in the mirror and you say, no, wait, I want to be managing partner of a great company, then get, get your butt in the office and say to people, hey, we have to have the courage to fail and the faith to succeed. Mm. Beautiful, man. Tell me, uh, Brennan, uh, just very quickly, what about books and tools or resources that, you, you know, that you've used or read <clears throat> recently or over the last 20 years or however, however long that you recommend to other entrepreneurs and CEOs to, to consume on their journey? Yeah, first of all, the best book I've ever read and I recommend it to everybody is The Tipping Point by Malcolm Gladwell. And every, after I read that book and every company I've gone into, I've kind of said, how are we going to get to a tipping point with our services or with our people or with the change where we go from having, you know, eight, 10 people per, percent of people like it to more tipping points. Great. Um, Jeffrey Moore's crossing the chasm where he talks about going from innovators to early adopters to the early majority, I, I think is, is fantastic. Um, totally selfish here. Um, you know, last week uh, I published, or uh, in April, I published a book with Forbes called The FUD Factor, uh, Facing Your Fear, Uncertainty, and Doubt to Achieve the Impossible. So I'm the author. So totally, total self-plug. And, and But what I tell you is it, it's, it really just, I, I got a, a, a lot of people in my network and people from 20 to 50 and told their stories of how they overcame their fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Because we're, we're, everyone, every one of us is afraid of failure. Um, so I'd say it, you know, it's kind of a contemporary book. Um, it's a quick read, you know, that would be another. Um, and, and so those would be a, f a few that I'd recommend. Cool. Love it. Shameless self-promotion here on the Mephron show. <laughs> there you go. Hey, but, but Hey, right after I admitted failure. So, you know, yeah, yeah, exactly. a, a, a little humility and then a bounce back. Yeah, exactly. Pitch. Way to box better. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's all good. Well, congrats on the book, brother. I think that's awesome. Um, and, um, yeah, just what an amazing story. Um, and so thanks so much, Brendan, for being on the show and for being vulnerable and letting the world know in your own way that it's okay to fail and, and in business. So appreciate you for being on the show. All right, Matt. Hey, thanks for creating this, uh, this conversation. I think it's really important for entrepreneurs to know that failing is just part of succeeding. Uh-huh. Exactly. Everybody else, we'll see you all again soon. Cheers. Cheers.